Today on the Topping Show, GameStop turns a profit, Blockbuster might be coming back, White Claw to make a vodka drink, YouTuber charges $10,000 for a thank you note, United States is still carrying the weight of NATO, Jake Paul charged by the SEC, layoffs are among at Indeed, Ferrari is hacked, all of that and much, much more on the Topping Show. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. Today's episode of The Topping Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN and Topping Technologies. ExpressVPN helps protect your online data and Topping Technologies is an IT value added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. If you're a business owner or an IT leader, if you use a little assistance, reach them at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Now jumping into the business part of the podcast, Indeed announced that they will be rolling out some layouts, unfortunately company is laying off around 2,000 employees, which if you equate the math, you find that's about 15% of the total employee base at the moment. CEO Chris Himes noted that he expects job openings to quote unquote decrease to pre-pandemic levels or even lower over the next two to three years. Chris also noted that he thinks that the company is quote unquote too simply too big for what lies ahead, which is probably true based on how many employees they have and how much revenue they're getting. It's one of those things where maybe a decade ago, they didn't have a monopoly, but they were one of the places to find a job. It was either Indeed or Monster.com, that one being one of the most original websites for job applications. Now, overwhelmingly, people are using LinkedIn for job applications, posting jobs or openings. And depending on your company profile, you usually have to pay for that, or you have there's a free a version where you actually post, I believe, one job requisition a month. And it's a big time saver because you don't have to deal with a resume, which I would argue most people are never going to read a resume again. They're just going to simply look at your LinkedIn. That's why I always tell folks, quantify every, all of your achievements. And then when you have the privilege of having an interview, then you can talk about the specific stories of how you achieve those actual statistics. So every time you have a role somewhere on your LinkedIn, give a couple bullet points of what you were assigned to do, what were your highlights. You basically want to intrigue them enough to get that first meeting. So LinkedIn is just dominating. That's why most all the recruiters are on LinkedIn paying for a premium or LinkedIn Navigator. They have, they have a package just for recruiting people. So if you're a recruiter, they have a special package to buy from Microsoft for LinkedIn, which Microsoft owns LinkedIn. So if I were to guess where Indeed is losing market share, that would be the biggest elephant in the room, so to say. And also, as we talked about earlier in previous episodes, with the economy declining, more and more jobs are being lost. The number of people hiring is also going to, of course, go down as well. And this is now no means every big business, but it's pretty much all businesses. Even Disney announced they were cutting, I believe, uh, 7,000 jobs. And they also said of these all these job openings, I think there are 45,000 job openings, they got rid of them. So not only are they laying people off, but they're not hiring. So all those job openings where they're paying to advertise, hey, here's an opening, apply here. If it's on a platform that's not your own website, you're gonna do something like Indeed or LinkedIn. So they're decreasing those sales as well. So again, the ripple effect of the economy and just the whole ecosystem being affected. Now, oddly enough and impressive enough, GameStop just turned a profit. GameStop being Pretty much the de facto video game retailer for my whole lifetime. I remember back in the day it was Funko Land, and GameStop quickly bought out most of the competition. It was a brilliant business idea, a Texas based company, and it was the place. If you wanted a video game or accessory, or if you're going to pre order, which used to be a huge thing because you usually get some sort of knickknack or goutremont that really enticed you to do it. I know Call of Duty used to have little toys you'd get, or little, I think one even had like a little polyester or some some artificial fabric of flag if you did a pre-order. So you were paying for a box with a flag in it and you had a little code and you know, the day the game was supposed to be released, just enter the code and you get the game. Now, they've been struggling particularly because more and more games are being sold online, especially direct to the manufacturer, direct to the, the actual publisher. You have the Xbox store, the PlayStation store, where if you have a system, just go to the store and you get the games you want. Similar to the iPhone, Apple store and the Google Android store, you're going to those stores, not going directly to the publisher. You're not going to a brick and mortar store like a maybe a Best Buy or Target or 
more realistically, probably a GameStop. So they've had a lot of struggles with those decreasing sales numbers year over year. Now, it's especially impressive. They've achieved their first quarterly profit in two years, which is extraordinary. So Matt Furlong is doing a great job. From He's their CEO. He came in, I believe, in 2020 or 2021, basically to turn the company around by not only decreasing costs, but having new initiatives, sales ideas, which have helped the company. Now, the net income particularly was $48.2 million. Now, you contrast that to last year's quarter. It was $147.5 million loss. So it's a twofold. Not only did they break even, they actually made a profit, which is extraordinarily difficult for any business. So to make that type of comeback is still great. It's interestingly enough that they were able to achieve those sales or those profit numbers when their sales went down by 1.2% last year. In 2022, they dropped by 1.4% year over year, and it was $5.93 billion. So their year, year, yearly revenue is astonishingly impressive. Now, what they had to do is decrease their costs. So a lot of the stores, historically, if you look at the ge- geographic locations, there are a lot of them cannibalizing sales, as in you have two stores that are three blocks away from each other. Well, the stores are going to steal, basically steal sales from each other. As opposed to if you get rid of one store, all the people within maybe a 10-mile radius, they'll all go to that one store. So there's a lot of consolidation over the past couple of years with GameStop. And another thing they, they were particularly interested in, they many analysts noticed that noted they were able to make a profit because they dropped their costs by 16%, which is a huge number when you have that type of a when that big of a business, 16% is huge. Now, it's one of those things where kept, hindsight's always 2020. 20. I should have bought some of their stock. Their stock went up by 48% after it was announced they made a profit. Which makes sense, although they still have a lot of long-term challenges because of the reasons I noted earlier. Those reasons are not going away. So they need to continue to adapt and try to find a new niche. A lot of people are recommending maybe they could have some physical land parties or local area network parties or tournaments. Make it more of an experience to bring the gaming community together as esports has become bigger and bigger throughout the years. So that's another trend that they could capitalize on. And they had the right leadership to do so. It'll be interesting to see how their game plan continues to evolve and what steps they take to hopefully keep growing so they don't have to deal with any more layoffs and they can go hopefully go out and hire more people. Now, on the downside of business, Ferrari had a data breach. The most prestigious brand in automotive for many folks is Italian engineering, for the longest time, they had a good old stick shift and a V12 was the thing that legends are made of. Granted, they haven't made that in over 10 years or 12 years now. Hopefully, they bring back the stick shift as they should. Now, the attackers gained access to Ferrari's IT systems and demanded a ransom. Specifically, the Ferrari noted that the attacker were able to get access to the network and they demanded ransom, but Ferrari claims that no data was stolen. Now, they have not noted if it was a simple traditional ransomware attack or a simple extortion attempt. Now, as soon as they had detection of the breach, they pulled in a third-party cybersecurity company once they received, oh yeah, here's demand for ransom. The vernacular around this is very confusing. I read it to a couple different websites. Now, I say confusing because a couple of those terms are contracting with each other, or contrasting rather. Now, that's pretty normal. Once you have a security breach, you usually do have, actually based on your cybersecurity policy, as I know from a tech company, you might have an obligation to bring in a third-party copy. They're also publicly traded. So that's a whole other area where you have a duty to your shareholders to actually let them know and the public know of security incidents. Now, Ferrari claims that they have not yet found any evidence that customer banking information or sensitive data was breached. So that's good because obviously that's some of the most invaluable data on the planet, especially when you look at who buys a Ferrari. They're all high net worth individuals. A lot of them own businesses, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of folks with, if you get their banking information, that's not good, of course. However, Ferrari did note that some of the information data was accessed, such as the name, address, email, and phone numbers of the customers. And the company policy is to not pay any of the ransomware, which should be the de facto policy for every business. That's what I always tell my clients from an IT company perspective. Because you might you might get lucky and they give you your data back. And I say might, because 
is by no means a sure thing. It's not like they're following a contract between two people or even a man's word to word. But even in the best case scenario, you pay that million dollar or whatever ransomware, you get your data back. Well, two things could happen. One, they could just re-encrypt the files. They could just, they still have access to your network. So they know how to get in. And even if you fix, let's say best case scenario, you get the data back and you fix that one particular entrance. Well, you just sent a signal out not only to that malicious actor, but to the entire malicious acting community that you will pay their fees, their extortion. You will gladly pay for it to get your data back. So it's a ripple effect. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse, and you're going to be attacked even more tenfold because it's one of those things where the hacking community, you know, I should say malicious hacking community in particular, the ones that are looking to do evil in the world, they have sales reps too. They get these lists of all these companies, and of course, such a big logo, it's going to get out that they paid anyway. So they're going to have this list and go, oh, wait a minute. Ferrari, they paid. So we're going to go after them because it's a proven business model for them. So thankfully, Ferrari said no. And it'll be interesting to see what the analysis from the forensic experts come back with and see where was the point of entry or how do they gain access to it? Was it an internal threat or was it just an accidental something an internal play did by mistake or was it a brute force attack? Oh, interesting to see how that develops. Now, interestingly enough, Blockbuster, there's rumors they might be making a comeback, which I find particularly interesting because if you can't, if you're just listening to the podcast, they have a giant Blockbuster sign behind me. Now, back in the day, Blockbuster had 9,000 locations. They were basically the monopoly of rental. They took the big investment or they put the, took the big risk adopting VHS technology when really no other stores were because a VHS tape was worth about $150. It was a prohibitively expensive item. But they figured if they buy it, they could rent it, recoup that investment, of course, make a profit. So they took that big risk, they got a big reward. Similarly, similarly, Netflix took the big risk of DVD technology, they capitalized, and then they pivoted to streaming. So, good to show you, take risk, you'll get rewarded, sometimes, hopefully. But if you take enough risks, I would argue, eventually, you'll find success. Now, after Blockbuster's demise, they went through bankruptcy. And, like traditional bankruptcy, businesses can compete, try to buy the remaining assets. At the time, Dish.com actually put in a bid. They won the rights for all their assets. So they won the bid. So they paid for the, all the rights, not only just the infrastructure in terms of, you know, customer databases, all of the statistics on which movies are rested, but also all the intellectual property, such as the name, logo, and likeness. So for the longest time, if you went to Blockbuster.com, and I, I would check this, you know, every couple of years, just kind of curious because who knows what might happen. For the longest time, it would redirect you. So if you typed in blockbuster.com, it would redirect you to dish.com, which makes sense. They bought them, they own them. And dish.com, that website, it would have an interesting Blockbuster logo on the side. But the majority of the splash page that you see would be the current dish offerings that you'd sign up for basically a sales page, which makes sense. Now, dish also, because they had that licensing that they could sell or rather like to do license agreements that's why you can still see a couple independent blockbuster stores throughout the years those stores similar to a franchise in terms of a licensing fee they would just pay dish.com for the rights to keep using the blockbuster name logo and likeness to run their stores now blockbuster.com a couple days ago it actually does not redirect you to dish.com so now, if you go to Blockbuster.com, it'll actually give you a welcome page with their iconic Blockbuster logo, as you can see behind me. And below it, it actually says the words, we are working on rewinding your movie. Now, some folks digged into the domain. They found that, you know, it's still owned by Dish.com. But a lot of people are speculating maybe there'll be a Blockbuster streaming service as the industry completely pivots in that way, which might be a smart way to get some nostalgia. At the end of the day, the big pivot and big kind of the linchpin or the big the big number in the equation when it comes to streaming services is one, how much money do you have? And two, how much intellectual property do you have to actually put on there? That's I mean, one of the reasons Disney is dominating the streaming wars is because they have the rights to pretty much every childhood memory people have in terms of media, cartoons, movies, what have you. And a lot of the other stations are struggling. I know Peacock, which is owned by NBC, their big draw is The Office because NBC made The Office. So that's a big draw, but it's really how much of that do you have? And then, of course, licensing, you can pay. I think Netflix paid about $100 million for the rights to have 
Friends, the TV show, on their streaming platform. So it'll be interesting to see if Blockbuster does this via Dish.com. What's the game plan? How much do they have in their war chests or their war funds? Because Dish, Dish.com, of course, has their Dish services, hence the name Dish.com. It'll be interesting to see if they continue to maybe pivot towards more of a streaming service. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Other interesting business news, White Claw is going to make some vodka. Now, White Claw was founded by Anth Anthony Von Mandolf in 2016. He's also the founder of Mice Hard Lemonade. And he was a business genius. He founded White Claw, which is an alcohol seltzer with 12 flavors that pretty much everyone... If you ever see a cliche party, every lady has it. I think there is... I did, I did a couple of research, did some Googles, did some brave searches... I did see one or two men holding a white claw in their hand. It might have been Photoshop. Don't know for sure. Further research is needed for that development. Now, he established the brand in, brand in 2020. And, or sorry, in 2016. By 2020, their estimate, estimated revenue was $4 billion. And in 2019, it was estimated that they account for over half of, of hard seltzer water sales. Between 2016 and 2020, estimated their sales volume grew by 275%, 60% market share. Literally a multi-billion dollar business. And they, more impressively, they beat out the incumbent. I was about to say technology. Perhaps brewing is technologically, is a technology in and of itself. But they beat out all the incumbent manufacturers, which is astonishing. Especially when you look at anything beverage related. One of my favorite shows is Shark Tank. They always ask you, what's the number one most important thing about any of those business models? And a lot of people will argue it's the color of the can, it's the graphics on the can, it's the taste. And every Shark Tank, every uh, shark will always tell them, no, no, no. There's one thing that matters above all else when it comes to that, and it's distribution, which is 100% accurate. If you look at any product, you look at Walmart, for example, that's one of the most valuable real estate on the planet when it comes to getting your product on their shelf. And if you can't get it on the shelf, you can only do so much direct to consumer, especially for things like beverages where the weight makes it prohibitive to shipping because it does cost a lot to do that. Now, to come out of this and have such astronomical success, basically to define a category is astronomically impressive. So. Before this, no one even knew about hard seltzer, relatively speaking. I never, I sure never have. They basically invented the category and dominated it with over 50% market share. Exceptionally impressive. And none of these other companies like Budweiser, all the competitors, never even thought of it. And now they're playing catch up. Now, one of the reasons that they, that Anthony Von Mandroff started this, or he's going to launch this initiative, is that they think the market for hard seltzer in the United States has peaked. Now, the, their plan is to make, I, I need to quote this because this is a whole new concept to me, is canned vodka soda cocktails. And their rock market research is saying that it will surpass hard seltzer as the category seems to be growing and growing, though they think hard seltzer will occupy all of booze sales by 2025 globally. So this is one of the most successful business pivots or evolutions, what have you. A lot of these businesses, I mean, history as you can see behind me with all the signage is defined there's many businesses that are defined by one hit wonders they have this one idea they knock it out of the park but they struggle to adapt with a new idea and they eventually unfortunately go out of business to see them pivot with this new idea given their track record of success i think him and his company is gonna be pretty successful with this new concept it'll be interesting to see i might even have to try one to see how it tastes for market research of course now going on to the culture part of the podcast a youtuber charged ten thousand dollars to send you a thank you note and i did check this was not a politician trying to give you insider trading because that might actually be worth ten thousand dollars or more now keep in mind after taxes the fee would be eleven thousand and twenty five dollars for that quote unquote service this comes from emma emma chamberlain who is apparently an influencer from california she has a 4.3 million dollar mansion in los angeles she has 12 million subscribers. She was even named one of the 30 under 30 on Forbes 2021. Thanks to her, and I quote, reliability, authenticity, and humor. And I must say this is quite humorous because $10,000 for a custom note is hilarious. And it, it would be interesting to see how many people actually clicked it. 
who fell for that scam? I mean, idea. Now, her and her publicity team claim it was an accident. For, it was an accident. They, they didn't expect people to pay $10,000 for a individual Instagram direct message. Though they did have a nice little breakdown under there of this for sale. It said, it was, oh, it's only $902 a month if you use this convenient monthly payment plan. Granted, if you actually do the math for one year plan, if you do the math, you're pay, you would be paying $830.96 in interest. Never forget, month to month is always a catch. There's convenience, but there's a trade off. Now, Mr. Beast, one of the most famous YouTuber, he made a joke saying he may actually buy it just to see what the heck she says, which he would probably get a couple million views just on that. He'd probably make a profit on that idea just because people would be so amused and bemused, be like, what does she think is worth $10,000? Is it just literally a thank you? Like, thank you for being a fan? Like, the mind merely boggles. Now, interestingly enough, Emma's website then took down the sales page and they put up a message, one of those bland BS messages, where they're saying that her company did it without her knowledge. It's not her issue. It's not her fault. And they claim that it was never meant to be activated. It was just to, or be able to purchase. It was only put up for internal testing. They weren't actually going to release it, which... Is something a publicist would say that's that is a hard job you have to do a lot of spinning in that position but it's just one of those things where if you're doing it for if you're doing something for internal testing well you're doing it to eventually deploy it i mean it's just why do it why do something and not execute on the plan but she did take it down so unfortunately you cannot spend your ten thousand or more accurately eleven thousand and twenty five dollars on whatever her thank you is but it is fascinating to see the rise of YouTubers and culture just becoming more and more mainstream as more and more people can actually make a living off the platform. So it's interesting to see how it's progressing. Now, going on to the politics, a little bit of interesting global politics, the United States is still propping up NATO and EU is still low on NATO spending despite the whole EU basically being at war with Russia. Now, specifically, a mere seven of the 30 alliance members in NATO spend at least 2% of their GBT, G. G, sorry, GDP on defense in 2022. Now, the clo ones that came closest was Germany at 1.49%, France at 1.89%, and Italy at 1.51%. Of the 30 members, only three more spent more than 2% on defense. That would be the United States, as well as, I believe, UK, and oddly enough, I believe the third one is Greece. Now, the US represents 54% of the alliance economic output, but they contribute 70% of the defense expenditure for NATO. 70%. Now, this, the second largest, so we're doing all that. The second largest is the United Kingdom, which accounts for 6% of NATO's spending. So it's been like this for a while. It's extremely disproportional. And it'd be interesting to see what are the long-term benefits of this. Some might argue perhaps it's more stability throughout Europe which would be a ripple effect. It would affect us perhaps with favorable trading terms as well as favorable, you get more products from their country because it's more stable, easier to, easier for people to invest in that and for our businesses to do business with their businesses because of course stability is one of the cornerstones for most businesses, usually helps smooth things over. But I just think it's interesting that it is very disproportional and the other countries are increasing their rates, but they still haven't met that goal of the 2% that they were all saying they would get to. So it'll be interesting to see how, if ever, they get to those points. Now, going on to the business blunder of the day, Jake Paul is being charged by the Security Exchange Commission, also rudimentally known as the SEC. Now, he is an extraordinarily popular YouTuber, and he's even done some boxing. And, of course, like so many celebrities, he thought it'd be a good idea to endorse and advertise cryptocurrency. Which every it seems every other week another cryptocurrency is going defunct. You have a couple that are more stable in terms of Bitcoin has been around for quite some time and it has fluctuated dramatically with the price, but it's still there. Now, the SEC is claiming that Jake Paul violated the investor protection law via promoting cryptocurrencies crypto cryptocurrencies and not disclosing that he'd be compensated for the promotion which is the dumbest thing he could possibly have ever done, especially when you look at what he does for a living. By now, he knows the rules of his game. He is a YouTuber. Even my small channel, even I have that disclaimer, or not disclaimer, 
I actually have, I check a button that says this video is done for profit because my tech company helps subsidize it, props it up, pays for a lot of things. So my IT company pays a little bit of money to the media company. So this isn't being done for free. And then we have advertisers on it. Now that disclaimer, I believe the F FTC ruled a couple years back on YouTube that if you're advertising something, you have to let the public know you have an incentive for that. You're not just doing it because you think it's cool. And a lot of people were deceived by that. So he's one of the biggest YouTubers. He's been doing this forever. He knows you have to check that box to let people know. You should have had that transparency to let people know if I'm bragging about this cryptocurrency, I am being compensated. And to not do that doesn't just tarnish your brand, but a lot of your investors got screwed. A lot of your, fa a lot of your fans. One of the most dis that's disgustingly disrespectful to mislead your fans. The only reason he can exist is because he has people willing to watch, like, subscribe, and all that kind of stuff with his platform. So it's extremely disrespectful and by far the biggest, biggest business blunder of the day. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. Don't forget to like to see more content like this. Like, subscribe, comment, helps the channel out. Also, don't forget, to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, heck, tell anyone to stay safe and fight the good fight.